We've got an action packed, star packed, amazing packed show tonight. We've changed the format. Now we are a news talk show. We've got uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger coming on. We also have uh, Brew Swillis. Uh, we've got who else? Do we have Adam Sandler is going to come on and talk about his really new crappy holiday movie about something that happens to a guy who falls and eats a hot dog and then it's radioactive and he gets superpowers to control television with his mind. And then we also have some uh, strange guy named Barnacles that's going to be on later. So stay tuned. Sandler's terrible movies are actually the most awesome altruistic thing in the world. See, what happens is he has a terrible idea for a movie, <laughs> and all of his friends are down on their luck, and they're, you know, it's like you're wealthy, and then it's like, oh, you know, your friends are like, hey, give me money. So instead of giving them money, he comes up with terrible movie ideas and then hires them to help on the movie, and then they make an insane amount of money, and everybody's happy, and that's an Adam so, Sandler so he's, movie. So he's basically like, oh, well, you, yeah, you can, uh, you can have some money, but you're going to have to humiliate yourself in this awful movie. It's freaking genius. He's, and he gets to laugh at it because he's like, <laughs> look what I made my friends do. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. I mean, <laughs> I would you. totally do that. That would be amazing. <laughs> all right, we're going to have some new stuff coming into the store very soon. Uh, we went all out. We we're getting some handmade uh, messenger bags and possibly also some backpacks, some um, some new kind of Jap- Japan or Korean-inspired uh, hoodies with the diagonal zip. We've got a few new things coming in. And I want more of your designs in our store because uh, people seem to love the designs from the community. So if, if you're someone who's new here, feel free to submit a design over at TechSyndicate.com, and we'll take a look at it. If we like it, we'll throw you some money or some free merch or whatever it takes, man. Soda pop. I don't know what you guys want. All right, um, let's check out this new device here. It's a Star Trek communicator. You know, everything, everything in the modern world came from Star Trek. Star Trek invented everything, from phasers to uh, doors that slide open to uh, uh, screens. We wouldn't have screens if it wasn't for Star Trek. Um, hallways. There's lots of hallways in Star Trek. And, and before that, it was just rooms on top of rooms, you know? So Star Trek invented everything. Well, here um, we have another company, and they're making something called OnBeep. It's the Onyx OnBeep. And the idea here is... Um, you know, a lot of times if you got your cell phone, it's just too cumbersome to call someone if you're in the store and be like, Hi, I'd like to buy some milk, and I'm at the store. What would you like, dear? Do you want acidophilus milk, regular milk, 2% milk, 1% milk, uh, skim milk? They've also got this new raw milk that's illegal in most places for whatever reason, but it's here on the shelf. What should I get? Well, now you just have to press the little button and be like, uh, yeah, I've got the milk. And then when you're done, you can hit it again and be like, all right, beam me home. They haven't figured that out yet, but you can say it if you want to, you know, be an idiot. You can definitely say it. So I feel like this is very similar to Nextal's beep and then you talk or whatever. The walkie-talkie thing that was uber annoying. I guess it was really good for some people. I not a lot of my friends used it all the time, you know, but um, it annoyed the shit out of me. And this seems um, kind of similar. And also the thing that's weird about this, it's a Bluetooth device that pairs with the device that's in your pocket. So... And it is a redundant device. I mean, it's easy and it's 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 made to be simple. But ninety nine bucks for one, you save five dollars if you get two. It's one hundred and ninety five for two. How about that? For a thirty dollar item, you're gonna save five <laughs> whole dollars. I don't know. Am I missing something here? This seems like a, a device that's probably not gonna do so hot. That's my prediction. I you know it, it's is it an app or is it a return to Nextel's? You know, like the way the Nextel stuff works. Because Nextel, Radio Shack totally had a Bluetooth headset that, w- that had the Nextel button. So you could, you know, you had the satellite sticking out of your ear and you could hit the button on the thing and then it would do the same thing as like the Nextel walkie-talkie button. So really the missing magic here with this is have they implemented the Nextel walkie-talkie functionality in software? Is that going to make a comeback? That's, that's how this is going to shake out. We'll wait and see. So I think it's an, it's all controlled in an app. Why is there a fly in this room? If I, can, if I get you fly, I'm going to punch you in the face. All right. Uh, Ford Police Cruisers. Speaking of punching people in the face, <laughs> Ford Police Cruisers, uh, they now have an ab- the ability to tattletale on police officers. They they, they can tell, uh, you know, if a, if a cop is running red lights, I guess. I'm not sure how they're going to know all this stuff. But, you know, a lot of times you guys see see cops out there and you, you'd be driving around and the, a cop will just throw his lights on and go right through a red light. And you're like, hey... Hey, dude, that's not, hey, man, that's just cheating. And as soon as they get through, they throw all, you know, they put their lights back off and then they just drive off like, <laughs> ran a red light because I'm a cop. I can do whatever I want. Well, this Tattletale device is being um, deployed in some places in uh, Los Angeles. The biggest problem right now is it's very expensive, but it's kind of interesting, you know, having something that 
tattletales on uh, police officers when they're jerks. Like I'm all for camera stuff. Yeah, I'm all for this this uh, accountability stuff. Cameras on police officers, you know, and, and as long as we do it under the guise of um, we're doing this for the safety of the police officer. We're mounting cameras on the police officer, and we're also going to make sure that the track the cars to make sure that the bad guys don't steal them or something like that or whatever. You know, they, they can put all that technology on there. I don't want us to be tracked. I want them to be tracked because we freaking hired them to work for us. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Well, I mean, it seems like in the public service job, there would be it would be a good idea to, uh, I don't know, have that documented, probably. Yeah. All right, moving right along here. Um, if you have um, a Google device, like an iOS, what, what's what's this Chrome for uh, Android and iOS as well? It's it's so it's not only just Android, it's Android and iOS. There's now a new data compression proxy server um, that Google has set up, and the way it works here, I'll scroll down so you can see. Um, you request data, um, and Google has a, you know a server here that that's running as a proxy. It compresses everything and then gives it to your device really quickly because it's compressing things. Sometimes fifty percent compression on this stuff sends it to your device. You save a lot of time, and it also well not so much saving time. It's more about saving data usage. This does not work on HTTPS uh, websites, so it won't work on our website. But here's the inter- interesting thing: when you go through a Google server, they can see everything you're doing. But you know what? Google can see pretty much everything you're doing if you're using Chrome. Google can see everything you're doing if you're logged into your phone. Google can see everything. Google is inside of you right now. Google is in your heart. So It's mining your avo- DNA as we speak. <laughs> if you want to avoid this kind of stuff, you're going to have to avoid all Google services. And is there a way to the i guess the only way to do this would be to get like a firefox os for the fire os or what do they call it i forgot firefox os or fire os you'd have to get one of those phones and not use any google services that's the only way that i can think of that to be able to avoid uh this kind of thing if you don't want to be tracked yeah we only mentioned it because this article went viral like everywhere and it's like guys 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 calm down now that we shouldn't be terrified of google seeing everything that we're doing but it, turning this proxy thing on and off Honestly, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, Google already sees everything. Uh, turning this on, turning it off, it really. Yeah. E- even if you're even if you're using the Firefox phone, if the uh, the website that you're going to has Google Analytics installed, so they can track their web visitor traffic and get reports on that. Uh, guess what? Google's tracking you there too. So. <laughs> uh? Yeah, man. Google is like Santa and Jesus all rolled up into one. <laughs> they just don't bring you your Christmas presents, but they're working on that. I like the episode of the, uh, I think it was South Park or some TV show where, you know, it's like, how does the NSA know where all the terrorists are with all this information gathering? And they chained up Santa and were torturing him so that he would <laughs> feed them information. It's very bad. People say that we are way too sympathetic when it comes to Google. And they say, like, we get a lot of hate mail and a lot of comments that are like, Wake up, guys. You guys are idiots. You you say that all these other companies like Apple are evil when Google is doing the same thing. And I think we do clearly state that Google is right there crawling up your butt. Oh, shit. I said too much. <laughs> Google, the Google <laughs> helicopter is inbound to, to take care of you. You've crossed the line. No. <laughs> Google snipers on the roof. Or they call them a... Uh, Sugles for never mind sniper and Google together, <laughs> never mind. Um, yeah, I, I um, the thing about Google with me is that they are the the best kind of evil. You know what I mean? They're evil, but they're they're evil in ways that are in my best interest usually. But I hate the fact that they have all the access to all my data, and I still use I, Gmail like a hypocrite, and it bothers me. I like I, today I just sat there and like I, I I've got to get off Gmail. I. I I, it's, everything is tied into it. It has been since I was a wee idiot lad. And um, <laughs> all my stuff goes to the same inbox, and it is a freaking mess. So I've got to get off email. My next goal is to get off a freaking Gmail soon. I Maybe mean, we'll make a video on how to do that too. Yes. Anyway. Oh, yes. That, well, that's definitely coming, especially now with the new features on FreeNAS where you can run everything. You can run your own home mail server now, and it's magical. But that's another subject for another day. Uh, <laughs> Uh, All right, let's see what else. Are you, go ahead. Well, it was uh, there's a book. There's a book that came out, and I feel like I have to mention it. That's in, it's related to this, so you know, Tangent Land or whatever. Oh, but it, it was. Uh, 
it, the WikiLeaks Julian one, right? Assange. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the book. And so Julian Assange wrote. It's like when WikiLeaks met Google. I think was the name of it. Haven't read it yet, but I was really intrigued by one of the reviews. Like one of the I, I'm. I read a bunch of reviews, and I don't remember which reviewer said it, but I think it was one of the more Luddite reviewers um, that's not really super into technology. But one of the things that struck me in the reviews was they were talking about how um, the Google founder maybe had a little bit of uh, naivete when it came to technology and how it would be used and that sort of thing. And, and I think a lot of the time when we're thinking of Google, we're not thinking about all the evil things they could do with the data. We're thinking of them just as like super nerds, like a benevolent dictator, kind of like Linus Torvalds is the benevolent dictator of Linux. Um, right. But, you know, the reality is that they, they do have corporate interests and, you know, eventually the power will lead to corruption. So some oversight would, would probably be good there. Hmm, there's an audio book here as well. I'm, I'm like very tempted to go ahead and like buy this while we're on the air, just like live right now because this is a live <laughs> show, right? You guys know this is live. Every time you watch it, it's live. We do it again. We well, have even, robots even that, the, every time you click the button, they do it. Even the Sunday Times reviewer says there, you know, Assange has one of the sharpest technological uh, brains there is, and sh the Schmidt transcript demonstrates how much stronger of a grasp he has of the web than even Google's executive chairman. It's interesting. Hmm. So if you guys want a Schmitty read, go ahead and pick up that book. All right, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get into the DMCA. I just love the DMCA. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I felt like I was singing a uh, was it Village People or whatever song. Hmm. Has anyone done that? I'm sure someone's done a DMCA Village People song. But never mind. Um, so now, apparently, quote unquote terrorists, whatever that word means, are using false DMCA claims to find. Uh, well, they, they, this is one instance, but I'm sure this is going to happen again and again. They're using it to find anti-Islamic YouTubers. So. Now what do we Oops. do when the system is being abused? Because the system was already messed up to begin with. You know, anybody can go on there right now and they can put a claim. Like someone put a claim on our video because we used a couple seconds of a the, the dead cat quadcopter flying around. And we're, we are fighting. We may get a strike on our account. It's It's been back and forth and I've filed my second appeal, which is the last appeal that you're allowed to file. And if they stay the, their claim, then we get a strike on our account and it's going to be really bad for us. But... It's that kind of abuse. It was obviously fair use with us, and this is abuse on the like the next level because they don't actually have any rights to any information uh, or any rights to any you know anything that was happening here. They just want to initiate this because it will give them the personal information of the YouTuber behind that. So now they're being able to use, abuse this system to get personal information. That's freaking scary. And then you know a group like this. If they're angry about whatever's happening with, you know, stuff that they, they get really pissed about their religion. So, I mean, they're angry about this. They could use this to do, you know, physical harm or something. They could inflict terrible things upon this person, find out where he lives. And I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, well, what do we do? He's about already this? getting already getting death threats. And so, yeah, the DMCA process used as a way to, uh, you know, sort of silence opposition, but also it's like, ah, we're just going to, we're just going to take him out. And, you know, I, I'm not sure. I don't know what the political situation is in Russia because I'm not there. And I don't want to say anything like super offensive, but it seems like maybe that Putin is up to his old KGB tactics because there've been a lot of weird accidents that have happened to critics of Putin in Russia. And so it's like DMCA takedown and then taking people out. That's kind of scary. Yeah, well, let's move on. Speaking of taking people out, um, the the final member of the Pirate Bay, uh, the final founder of the Pirate Bay, Frederick, I'm not sure how to say his last name. I could probably watch a video and hear it, but I'm probably going to mess it up because I don't have the accent. Uh, but Frederick has finally been captured. Here he is in this picture here, this tiny... Wow, that's a tiny picture. There he is right there in this very pixelated picture. Anyway, he's finally captured in um, in Thailand. And what's interesting about this is he was captured because he was wearing the same shirt... That the police, uh, well, the police looked at a picture and he was, you know, there he was, and he ended up wearing the same shirt one day. This is a terribly convoluted way to say it. He's wearing the same shirt as he was in the picture in the want ad. The want ad? The wanted poster or whatever. There you go. Now, here's the, th the funny thing. There's been some updates since then. Everyone's wondering, you know, how did he get caught? What happened? Well, of course, that's one thing. But apparently, an American or U.S. movie companies hired a law firm to track him down. 
And um, yeah, how ridiculous is that? So he's in Thailand. And of course, he you know he that that's violation of his um, he had parole in uh, I think Sweden or whatever. So he's he's violating parole, but. It wasn't Sweden that tracked him down. According to this, we haven't, you know, received all the information, all the information yet. It was the U.S. movie companies. They're not even a law enforcement group. That's the U.S. <laughs> movie companies. We say that now, but somebody's going to be playing this on YouTube in twenty, you know, twenty thirty six. And they're like, well, they're not a law enforcement group. I thought that was, you know, as so we get <laughs> the DEA, the FBI, and the CIA. Now we get the MPA, the RIA. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're now the branches of the law. We've, you know, we've, God knows we've only got 900,000 branches of the law. It's like every... <laughs> there's there's going to be a branch of the law for every individual item that you can purchase in like a big box store like Walmart. Every single item, like fans, toothbrushes, there's going to be a branch of the law that just deals with toothbrushes and they can kick your door down if you're using the wrong toothbrush because there's always on DRM <sighs> on your <laughs> let's toothbrush. See, let's see. Let's see, we got the legislative, the executive, the judicial, and now the commercial branch of the government. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you say that now, but Princeton did a study this week, or I believe they finished up a study this week, and they determined that the USA was no longer a democracy. It's an oligarchy now. <laughs> That's from Princeton University, a, a study they did over with many learned people and many big books and, and research things. Not, not to get yeah. off track, but if you guys want to be really horrified about just how corrupt things are in the United States, you guys should check out the Rolling Stone article on the terrible things that Chase did in the subprime mortgage and how our Department of Justice was completely ineffective dealing with that. Back to Sweden, where most of our awesome audience members are. You know, most of our audience is in Europe, I believe, now. I think we've we've crossed the threshold. We've where Our biggest group is now in Europe instead of the USA, so... Back to Oz. Yeah, in Oz. You guys are awesome down there in Oz. I've never been to Oz. I don't know anything about it. All right. Um, so this is the other, you know, uh, co-founder of the Pirate Bay, Peter Sund. I think I botched that, but you guys can yell and scream at me in the comments. Anyway, he's been in prison for about a year, and uh, he said that prison, uh, you become brain dead. That's interesting that he would say that because th their prison system over there is completely different than what we have here and then like if you compare it to like other countries it's actually quite nice the other thing that's interesting is he's he's only in there for a year and then um you know the other guy even after blowing parole and stuff he'll be there for two or three years at, at max because i mean it, it's not murder he's not a psycho he's not blowing up people he's um it, it's copyright problem so it's 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 not like in their country they have sort of an appropriate punishment for something that something like that so here they put you in prison for 20 years if you even drop the dvd and somebody else picked it up in a mall like ah there you are you've you've dropped a dvd and someone else picked it up in a mall you've shared our intellectual property 20 years in jail never see the sun again that's it so yeah anyway interesting stuff there oh the fbi they're just arresting everybody this week so the fbi has also arrested uh, blake defcon benthal uh, the Silk Road 2.0. So, you know, Silk Road 1.0 showed up and they got the guy finally. I forgot why. I think it was because Tor, right? Wasn't it because Tor? He's, he's on trial, and so, but the case is falling apart. But he was arrested about a year ago for the first version of Silk Road, and then immediately 17 clones of Silk Road popped up. And this, along with some other stuff like Silk Road, uh, was just swept up. And you know, the R's article talks a little bit more about that. Yeah, so you guys, if you need your drug fix, you're going to have to wait till Silk Road version 3. Just uh, keep on waiting for that. It should be fun. <laughs> or go down to your friendly neighborhood, what, what are they called? Gang bangers? I'm not really sure. <laughs> gang bangers. <laughs> your friendly neighborhood gang bangers. We need a t-shirt that, you know, has like a picture of something uh, gang interesting. Gang busters? <laughs> That's busters? Right. I don't I'm know what so that means. I'm so sheltered. I don't know. We should edit this part out. <laughs> no, we've got to leave it in. I want to know what the comments say about this. This is hilarious. I have no uh, idea, but it seems it seems like a worse situation when you have to go deal with, like, the criminal element as depicted in, say, Breaking Bad versus just, you know, getting it through the mail. I mean, it seems like one is a lot harder on a community than the other. Yeah. All right, let's quickly check out our sponsor. This time we're going to talk about Squarespace. 
Now we use them for our store because it's all about the content. It puts the content forward and that's what really matters here, the content. We're trying to create our identity on the internet and they've made it very easy for us. If we want to go in and add a color, add a size, it's, you know, just add different options. It's just super easy. Integrates with ShipStation in the back end. Now we're now on Squarespace 7 and the same philosophy is applied here. They want the tools to kind of get out of the way so that you can really create the site that you want. They've streamlined everything and made it just very easy to create sites on the fly. And above and beyond that, they've improved their mobile app so that you can just uh, use Android or iOS. And there you go. Go ahead, edit, create, check your analytics, add images, you know, blog, whatever. You can pretty much create your entire site. Um, from your mobile device if you wanted to. If you're a developer, you're gonna have Git access, so you can get in there and mess with everything. It's not just a website full of flashy templates that you know lock you into a certain thing. You can get in there and do everything if you want to, but if you wanna go fast and just get things done, you can do that as well. Some of you guys out there need some professional images, well now, a couple of clicks will get you a Getty image. Cover pages is also new, and uh, the idea here is sometimes you only need one page. So there it is, there's your one page ID very simple and clean there's now integration with google apps for email docs spreadsheets you know everything so check that out i mentioned that they were listening to the audience for feedback and template ideas they've also they've also partnered with some of the quote unquote world's most inspiring people and check this out this is uh alex hanold he's uh, one of the best free solo climbers in the world he needs a nice clean and simple website but uh here he is free soloing up the side um of the granite at uh yosemite very very cool to watch I mean, even the behind the scenes is kind of unbelievable on this. So I think it's cool that they're doing stuff like this. But you guys can go down and get the, the template that they, uh, you know, designed with him in mind and then customize it to your heart's content. Someone else that they partner with is uh, St. Luca. He does uh, pop. I'm not familiar with his music, but uh, you guys could check out that template as well. So there's just a lot of new templates and a lot of new things that you guys can do uh, with Squarespace. Keeps growing, keeps getting better keeps getting more robust and yet at the same time uh, it's not getting clunky and it's not getting in the way it's all about staying out of the way so your content is forward it's all about staying away so that the user experience on the back end is streamlined so that's Squarespace now back to the regularly scheduled tech all right, let's keep traveling the globe. I'm having a lot of fun here, and now we're finally getting over to Australia. Now, Australia, they have a new terrorism law thing, uh, and uh, the, the whole idea is what they, the government said, hey, all our ISPs must now retain data so that we can go back and look around through it because, hey, look at it. People in the USA, they're loving it. Even the public loves it, right? Well, so here in Australia, you must retain data for up to six months. And here's the funny part. So they, you know, first that was going to be used for law enforcement officials and that sort of thing so they could stop terrorists. It's always about stop terrorists or save the children. Just remember that, stopping terrorists and saving children. So now it turns out that they're going to allow um, these laws to work for copyright enforcement. So now if you're like a movie company or something like that, you can come in and just you know look through this data and be like, oh, it looks like, um, looks like this guy, Bob or whatever, was downloading some movies. Let's prosecute him to the full extent of the law make him pay like three hundred thousand dollars for downloading a little movie or something so yeah it's going to be used for that now which is just great everything's just going you know what everything in australia will kill you that's it even the politicians everything will kill you <laughs> and how do you guys even like how do you guys even get down to the post office i mean without getting either shot by the police or uh, it's, it's so bad over there well, or, or eaten by a, a crocodile the thing with this is you're gonna it, there's gonna be a database now that can be trawled um, for things, and so it's totally gonna because this already happens everywhere. Uh, but it's like, hey, you know, you get an outstanding parking ticket. Uh, let's go search your house because we want to search your house for other reasons. It's like that actually happens a fair bit. Huh, Wendell, have you seen the time? Uh oh, no, it's rant thirty. It's rant thirty. So Time Warner has um, ha has said that. You're gonna love data caps. No, listen, no, no, no. You're you're gonna love data caps. And everyone's like, no, no, we don't want data caps. Please, please, no data caps. And when Time Warner hears the word no, they're kind of like uh, one of those douchebag guys at a bar where it's like no just means uh, maybe or whatever. I don't I don't know what their freaking phrase is, but every time I hear someone say that phrase, it makes me want to like shatter their face with my fist. Like no means no, dude. Time Warner, no means no. So here's what's interesting. They've got their data caps that they're thinking about rolling out. And what they're doing is they're going to offer several different tiers of service. So not only can you get like, you know, 10 megabits, 50 megabits, 100 megabits, 
as far as your speed goes, well, now you can get different data caps and you can pay, pay differently depending on what you need. And um, they said, you know what? You can pay for unlimited, but it's going to cost you a lot of money if you want unlimited. They said most of their people, they use um, 35 gigabytes per month on average. And uh, some will be able to take advantage of it. So, so, they, so they made a couple different plans. One's the 5 gigabyte per month plan. And the other one is the 30 gigabyte per month plan because they said they wanted to make sure that they were able to, you know, give their average user the average service that they, you know, expect on average. So let me do the math here. You're giving them 30, 30 gigabytes when on average people use 35. How do I, I, I what? That doesn't make any sense. That sounds like they're trying to guarantee that everyone is going to get charged overage fees. And let's go ahead and break it down a little bit more. So the average is 35. Well, in reality, everyone watching this show is probably using more, uh, you know, more, more or less 100 to 500 gigabytes per month, sometimes even more. So we've got guys like us and girls like me and us. <laughs> what? I don't know. We've got guys and girls that are like us who are out there just sucking up the bandwidth and then you got you know grandma and you got the people who just actually watch television people actually do watch television and they're probably using you know like five gigabytes per month so there are some probably a few people in there who fit the average but by and large i bet that it's a lot of people in the low end and a lot of people on the high end and they're gonna have to pay a lot of money so how in the hell does 30 gigabytes per month make any sense and then if you, I mean, if you really want to get back and look at it, I mean, data bandwidth caps don't make any sense anyway, because bandwidth is not a resource that we're going to run out of. It's all about adding more ports, really. That's all it is. It's not like, oh, we've only got four buckets of bandwidth. That's not what it is. It's like we've only got 50 things plugged in. We need to plug in a few more things. So, yeah. You know what's really, I don't, go ahead. You know what's really horrifying? 30 gigabytes a month is a gigabyte a day or less than one megabyte a minute. That is a definition of broadband that is on the order of, you know, dial-up modems. Hmm. Let's do, let's do the math here real quick. All so right. we got 24 hours in a day, and you get about a gigabyte a day, because it's about 30 gigabytes a month, let's say. So that's, uh, you know, 1,000 divided by 24, that's about 41 megabytes a minute. Yeah, all right, so divided by 60 is about 0.69. Yeah, that's just, wow. That's just, <laughs> that's insane. So we're, we're in kilobit territory here. 30 gigabytes a month is in kilobit territory. Good Lord. Well, okay, let's go above and beyond that. We'll tie all this back in, in just a second. So the FCC and freaking Tom Wheeler, we called it, we called it, we freaking called it. Tom Wheeler is definitely on the side of um, the ISPs and and, and he's lo he loves cable. He's come up with this new quote unquote hybrid, hybrid plan. It is exactly what we have been begging him not to do. We've sent in millions of complaints well, 800,000 it looks like so far no no millions 4 million I don't even know yeah 4 million 4 million people said please please we don't want the slow lanes and the fast lanes but his new hybrid plan it's slow lanes and fast lanes all over now with a new word that sounds kind of cool like hybrid it's so yeah we're gonna have to look out for that coming pretty soon and it looks like he really is aggressively going to move forward on it there um there's uh well there's a, there's a document that's been leaked i'm not sure where it is here but if you guys want to go and look at the document i'll make sure it's in the links um but the document pretty much outlines tom wheeler's diabolical plan and here's the funny thing so you know we, we've all talked about um you know you know um reclassification under title two well verizon says that they do anything if they sneeze anywhere near net neutrality or title two they will sue the government because Verizon believes that since it's their infrastructure and since it's, uh, you know, their network, they should be able to control exactly what happens on it. And they've already sued for stuff like this before and won. So their the network paid for by taxpayer dollars in the form of rebates and tax incentives. Dun, 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 dun. But it's ours. But it's come on, man. It's ours. We, we, we we've got our name all over it. Right. It's like, yeah, <laughs> no. So it, it, a gigabyte a day is literally two to three times faster than dial-up, 
we they are trying so hard to send us back to the 80s why are they doing that and i'll tell you why it's early adopters so early adopters like us are using 100 gigabytes a day or not 100 gigabytes a day but 100 gigabytes a month and that's netflix and video conferencing and everything and what that means is all the services that these companies have provided traditionally are turning into just a stream of bits they have no say so they have their television packages it's terrible a set top box is the most god-awful, excruciating, bamboo-shoots-under-the-fingernail experience <laughs> that you will ever, ever experience. Why can't I just click on a show I want to watch when I want to watch it? Why do I have to browse through a thing, a set-top box guide thing that has ads? It is the most terrible experience ever. It exists in a state like... It's just... I don't even... It's, it's 1985. It is perpetually 1985. And here we have 1985 uh, bandwidth numbers that they're talking about. And it's like, oh, this is average. It's like, well, no, it won't be average in five years. The reason that it's average is because a lot of people uh, have not adopted the technology yet. They're stuck with their 1985 set-top box because they don't know how terrible it is. It's like they've got bamboo shoots under their fingernails. And they're like, well, I used to get hit in the head with a shovel, and the bamboo shoots are not quite as bad. But when we show them how great the world can be with digital technology, they're going to be like, wow, I had no idea how terrible it was with those bamboo shoots under my fingernails. The only option that I see for any of this is what's happening in Colorado right now and several other places in the world. But seven communities in Colorado uh, have just decided to create their own broadband. So this is above and beyond what they're doing in a lot of places. A lot of uh, local communities are... I guess, legally obliged to not compete with other businesses. Well, in Colorado, it's a bit unique. What they said in Colorado was, you know what? Local municipalities can have their own broadband uh, internet and their own high-speed internet if, quote-unquote, an election shall be called. And so that's just what happened in, in Colorado. They put it on the ballot, and the majority of the people said, yes, we would like our own internet in seven different communities. So now... Um, there's going to be local municipal internet in several places in Colorado. Uh, it's, it's stuff like this is, is, is happening all over the country, and we need a lot more of it, and we need it fast because it is the only thing that's going to keep the, the internet neutral. It's the only thing that's going to treat the internet as a utility, and it's the only thing that's going to ensure that the, that the internet uh, stays the way it is so that, it be, so that it's like you know, a learning tool for our freaking posterity, man. As if they tear that down. God. <laughs> Well, I mean, We're be for things way like, back in time, for things like Khan Academy and online learning and online instructor-led stuff, it's a lot better if you have really high-definition streaming video and you're able to interact with the professor and do all this other kind of stuff. Doing that over dial-up is just it would it would just wouldn't function. It just it's not going to work. It's it's status quo. Uh, and think about all the other technology that we don't we haven't even invented yet. I mean, super high-resolution 3D models for the 3D printable whatever of the future, uh, that's probably going to need a lot of bandwidth. There's probably a lot of other applications that are, gonna, that, are, that are going to need a lot of bandwidth too. What happened, these ISPs set the cap at 300 megabytes in an era before things like uh, MP5, MP, uh, the H265 compression algorithm and things like that were invented. Even MP4 wasn't really all that great. And so they're like, yeah, this is a trend. We'll set it for 250 or 300 gigabytes. And what's happening is the compression technology is improving so that we can, it's not quite as bad with 250 or 300 gigabytes. And so they're like, crap, we need to move that threshold much lower. People aren't hitting the threshold as early as we expected, damn it. And so it's really, the whole thing's just a rip off. The whole thing's a sham. And people are being, this is, people are being defrauded. And they don't know they're being defrauded. And there's not, there are only a few consumer watchdog groups that are uh, aware of what's happening. And the politicians don't seem to care, which is really, really horrifying. They're paid not to care. So that, that's another <laughs> problem. We are in an oligarchy, remember? And I will remind you guys until I'm blue in the face that we are in an oligarchy. And, um, yeah, it, it is time to... Uh, Time to immigrate. How, uh, I'm going to clap right here. and compete in the global marketplace? It's just, we, we ought to be able to compete in, in, in the global village, but no. A new challenger has appeared. Hello. What's going on, What's man? Up, so, uh, Barclays, how you been, man? It's uh, It's been never since you've been on the show. I know, right? What's, what's going on? Are we, are we keeping tallies here? This is one of the few shows I haven't been on. Uh... No, actually, I'm doing pretty good. Um, still trying to get used to the whole uh, not working at Microsoft thing and kind of being my own boss. You know, it's it's kind of hard to be motivated when you can do whatever you want pretty much whenever you want. 
So yeah, you know, I kind of want to ask a couple of questions about that because I mean, you get to work all day in your pajamas. You wearing your pajamas right now, by the way? <laughs> Dude, is a bear shit in the woods? Come on. <laughs> now, I, I want to ask you something because I, you know, I've. I've Started this, but I read an article the other day, and it was like, if you really want to be successful in the world, every day when you first wake up, you got to put on like a suit. Even if you're working at home all by yourself, just put on a suit and have a cup of coffee, and then you'll be successful. Um, I, I kind of feel like that's a, maybe for idiots, but I don't know. Do you feel like you would be? Do you, do you feel like you would be doing better if you got up every morning and put on like a suit or something? No, I feel like I'd be depressed and probably trying to jump off my house. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, like, come on, that's like the perk of working at home, right? You got to think. It's like I can literally roll out of bed, go take a shower. Clothing's optional throughout the day, and then I might put some pajamas on if I've got, like, a high-profile show like this or something to be on. You know, I want to look my best. <laughs> now, the other thing I think is kind of interesting is that a lot of the viewers out there, I don't think they get this. They, they think that you're, you're Barnacles all the time. You're always excited about everything, but that's not necessarily the case. Is there, is there anything you, like, do to get motivated before you make a video, or do you usually just try to wait until you're, you know, Feeling, feeling it, and then do you do you make your videos? How how do you do that? Well, I mean, drugs and alcohol help a lot, but yeah. uh, you know, when, when when I don't have access to those, you know, it's it it is it does take some work to get motivated some days, and it has a lot to do with a couple of things: what I'm reviewing, and just my general mind state. Right? If I'm exhausted, I'm not sleeping well, my back's bugging me, or like when I went to World Maker Fair and I lost my voice. Remember that wonderful one? That was fun. <laughs> yeah. So that I'm just now getting my voice back. So that was a rough couple of uh, months. But it's one of those things where it's like you do have to get yourself in the mood sometimes. And honestly, I just do a bunch of really, really silly shit. Like seriously, one day I couldn't wake up. I was like really tired. I tried to shoot the video. I couldn't do it. I literally just went and drank two shots of coffee right out of the espresso machine and ran up and down my stairs like a half a dozen times. Like literally just to get myself amped up and get my heart racing. And then after that, the coffee kicked right in and carried me through. So it was perfect. But there are days where I literally just can't shoot. I mean, I've, I've had those days. I've had bad days where... I get up and it's like, you know, not all my ducks are in a row. Shit's kind of falling apart. And I'm just like, man, I go turn on the Xbox One and I don't make a video. And that sucks for everybody that wants a video. But at the same time, I'll never make a video unless I'm in the mood to do it. That's like kind of my thing. Yeah, when you start like trying to force out the content, that's when the content starts to get kind of boring. And nobody wants to watch that. So now yeah, you guys see. <laughs> yeah, now you guys get to see a little bit about, about what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, so that was uh, Barnacles. If you guys want to see us talk about 3D printing, the future of the world in 3d printing terms go ahead and click on the screen right here and uh you know watch that video i think it was pretty pretty fun to talk to barnacles so you guys should go watch it please maybe if you don't i'll pour soup down your pants and i ain't gonna let it cool first it's going hot right down the front of your pants all right <laughs> i don't know I, I went from asking nicely to telling them what to do and that's just kind of the way i do it i i asked nicely once or twice and if you're still sitting there well, you, you're either going to do it or you're going to have to run for your life. That's just the way it is. All right. Um, let's talk about hardware. Now, we have received a lot of flack because we don't use a lot of the canned benchmarks out there. And one of the reasons that we don't use a lot of the canned benchmarks is because some of them seem to favor one company or another. And it's usually Intel because Intel has a pretty decent compiler. And they like to run around with programs like Cinebench and... Uh, Sysmark and other things and say, hey, why don't you use our compiler? And um, right here, we have proof, finally, that what we're saying is not a bunch of nonsense. Intel has agreed to pay $15 to Pentium 4 owners because of the Athlon benchmarking shenanigans. How about that? That's ridiculous. So hey, for, those of you, for those of you that may not realize the historical perspective here, if you had an AMD uh, Athlon X2... Kudos, because everybody with an Intel part at that point in time had an absolute and complete turd. If you had an AMD Athlon X2, it was the Jesus Master Race processor and should have built a uh, an incredible financial empire for AMD because it was, by all accounts, far superior technology, far superior implementation, higher instructions per clock. Uh, it was just it was superior in every way imaginable. The Pentium 4 was an absolute and complete turd. The netburst architecture was so terrible that they had to go back to the Pentium 3 for the core architecture. And so the core duo, which wasn't released in America, I had to import one from Japan. Uh, terrible. But uh, 
the the core duo is a souped up dual core Pentium three. The, the you remember the old uh, copper mine uh, Tualatin flip chip, all that. They they went back to that because Netburst, the Netburst architecture, was that bad. And so this is a fifteen dollar like validation in law that oops, Intel was pulling some shenanigans with the Pentium four, being like, look how amazing and fast it is. No, it was terrible. It was absolutely it was just wrong. It was an abomination. Let me just go ahead and show you some of these uh, benchmarks here because this one's kind of funny. POV Ray, um, this is way back when, 2004. But the original tests done with POV Ray, um, the Intel i7-4770K scores, this is a you know current test, uh, 370. And then the A10-7850, uh, which is a very slow, well, compared to the 4770K, it's a very slow APU. It scores 115. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, the guy who wrote this article, he, he's like, hey, this seems a, a bit weird. And, you know, the guys from POV Ray were like, listen, you can go download the source code. It's right there. It's open source. You can look at everything. And they looked at it, and he's like, well, there's, you know, there's no code in here that's fishy. So instead of using the executable, uh, he recompiled the source code and ran the tests again. So without any, you know, weirdness, the AMD did much better. Almost like a little, little better than twice as good. So he he ran a lot of different tests with a lot of different CPUs, and it, it just seems that a lot of the tests would either check to make sure it was an Intel genuine part, or they would it, it, it was basically they were making the AMD parts look bad, and that's totally uncool. And that's why I really kind of like the indie games and that sort of thing when it comes to benchmarking. And I know we got a lot of hate on our videos. We're gonna make more videos, and we're gonna keep trying them out. This week we tried the 9590 in Pistols Rig with a whole bunch of games and it maxes out everything. It's ridiculous. But on top of all that, I still use Intel. So there it is. I, I, I still well, use, I've got the 6 core in my own system and I've got the 8 core in uh, a different system. I use them even though they're really freaking expensive because AMD doesn't have anything that fast at this point in time. It just, they don't have it. I'm sorry. But four or five times the cost. So, you know, you get what you pay for. Um... And let's be insanely, incredibly precise because some people have already written terrible negative YouTube comments and they're going to reply to their own comment and be like, damn it, you guys actually mentioned that. Okay, well, I guess that's fine, whatever. <laughs> uh, th let's be insanely specific about how Intel was rigging these benchmarks. It was not, it was not as if there was something in the code that was like, if, uh, uh, if Intel then do really terrible things in the compiler, it was more... Um, check this CPU and this stepping to de determine if this instruction is available. And if the CPU is not this vendor and this step, uh, not stepping necessarily, but the, uh, the ID numbers that go with the processor. And so they sort of had a table in their compiler of which processors support which instructions. But on AMD, they did not have a comparable table of instructions. Now, the compiler, you could totally write a routine that says, let's try to do this x86 instruction, and if it fails, fall back to this other instruction. But that's not how Intel implemented their compiler. Now, as smart as those guys are, is that an oversight? Because if you were a complete moron and you were writing a compiler, you might make a mistake like that. But I don't think that was a mistake. I think that was probably on purpose. And you could say that, well, they didn't want to look up the specific specifications for whether or not Intel supports it. But there's an instruction to check if an instruction is available. So why wouldn't you do that? That doesn't make sense. So it's probably evidence of wrongdoing. All right, guys. I don't uh, hate Intel. You guys can send me hate mail all you like. I just don't like shenanigans. That's basically all there is to it. Unless they're silly shenanigans. I do like silly shenanigans. Well, it's kind of a sad day. Uh, it looks like Zalman's parent company has filed for bankruptcy. Here's the article here. Um, apparently, they were up to some shenanigans. They uh, could have been involved in some fraudulent activities. It looks like they owe the bank a lot of money. And this does not look good for Zalman Tech at all. And, um, I mean, the article cites things like, you know, hey, the members of these companies were, were making pit stops in Hawaii and renting Mercedes and BMWs and Ferraris and stuff like that. But I think a lot of companies do that. You know, it's kind of a kind of a normal thing in the industry. You know, you want to do that for your employees who are working their asses off and going to events all over the world. Let them drop off in Hawaii for a couple of weeks and rent Ferraris and stuff. I don't think that's too unusual for a company that's, you know, positive in the cash flow area. So I don't think that should even really be 
too much part of the article unless it was like they were stealing money from children and doing that or, or, or stealing or, or killing people and then using the money they were getting from the, the hits to do that. But the bottom line here is that this could be a bad thing for Zalman. It doesn't mean Zalman's closing the doors just yet, but maybe. You know, that's... that's <laughs> They used to be. The they used to have the most. Yeah, they used to have the most powerful uh, air-based CPU cooler on the planet. And uh, wow, I still, I still, I still like have, a few other products. I still have a 17-pound copper orb that was like it was just a huge cube of the copper. The fanless one. No, well, it was. Uh, yes, but you could run it with a fan, and it turned magical if you did. Um, so it was just a big copper cube with tiny fins but you know it turns out accounting shenanigans is not just for uh hsbc and multinational banks anymore i guess <laughs> yeah i guess that's true all right let's take a look at the uh the new radeon r9 290x cards that are coming out with eight gigabytes here's the sapphire one. Oh man i really want this one I quite enjoy sapphire's products you know if anybody um a lot of, a lot of people who are just in you know nvidia fans and stuff like that they look at companies like Asus and uh, MSI and companies that make NVIDIA and AMD cards, and they think that those are possibly the best. Well, I also want to mention that Sapphire does make all of the OEM cards for uh, AMD. So they do know what's going on when it comes to AMD stuff, and I do like their part products. So anyway, that's just that's kind of an aside. But we can expect some 8-gigabyte cards, and also you know the, the GTX 970 and 980 are releasing 8-gigabyte versions as well. It seems like they're getting ready for 4K resolutions. I'm not sure if those cards can... Um, well, I guess they will for most games, but for some of the newer games, I don't know if they're going to be able to even deal with 4K even with the extra memory, but it will be nice to have that extra RAM for certain things, maybe Skyrim mods. Everything I think of everything, whenever I see GP memory, I always think, ooh, Skyrim mods, now what can I run? <laughs> hmm. I, Get that I'll memory patch and go. I'd be curious to try the Wolfenstein because I'm really impressed with the architecture of uh, ID's new engine that's in Return to Castle Wolfenstein, even though the game's not really that great. And I wonder if having that much texture memory when playing at 4K would solve the texture pop problem because the performance was actually pretty good on at 4K. I mean, all things considered. Yeah. Hey, Wendell, I got one for you. How about those underwater wind turbines? <laughs> It's not really wind if it's underwater, is it? If the wind yeah. is made of water, is it wind? I don't yeah, see, know. Yeah, that's that the that. thing. You know, I, I, I really wish I had more time to scuba dive, but the last two times I've gone out there, the wind on the bottom of the goddamn ocean was so <laughs> ridiculous that we weren't able to go down. It's like, oh, this wind is going to knock you out as soon as you get in that water. It's just a maybe, too windy. Maybe, maybe it's a wind turbine that goes under the water when it's not generating electricity. So when there's no wind, it submerges. Or when there's too much wind, it submerges. But when there's just the right amount of wind... It emerges from the ocean. <laughs> I don't think that's how it works. It looks like what, what's happening here is they've created uh, some some turbines that are very similar to the wind turbines that we have, and they go on the bottom of the ocean in certain areas that are you know make sure it's deep enough. They're not nearly as large, but they're able to generate more power because the current is constant down there. So they're essentially wind turbines that look very similar to our wind turbines that we have here uh, above the water. So that's pretty much all it is. But um, yeah. There's been so many freaking articles that have come out that have called them wind turbines, and it just really, I guess that's a good way to understand it because it looks like a wind turbine, but no, 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 it's a, it's a freaking, it's hydro stuff, man. <laughs> if one more person calls know. it a wind turbine, an underwater wind turbine, I'm going to start, I'm going to go out in the street and just start punching things. <laughs> Someone's going to do it just so, just so they can see me on the news. Like, man goes rabid and punches people in public for hours. Energy generation from uh, the movement of ocean water is not exactly a new thing either. So uh, maybe this is just meant for attention-grabbing headlines. Or maybe the SEO person that wrote the article was like, I'm going to do some SEO on this article for wind turbines, and I'm going to write the dumbest headline possible so it'll go viral. <laughs> you know, that's probably true. <laughs> All right. It More works. science here. <laughs> well, I mean, we're covering it. I don't know if that's viral, but a slight blip in the analytics maybe. Oh, damn it. Why did, we, <laughs> why did I let this happen? I wanted to laugh about it. Uh, reversing aging. That's that's a thing that's happening right now. So I mean, you know, people at different university and learned places all over the world are working on this, but scientists at Harvard and uh, New South Wales have reversed the aging process in mice, and they're going to start testing this stuff on human beings very soon. 
So, I mean, you guys can, we could get into this, but um, they're essentially um, trying to reactivate a lot of the molecules. Well, I don't even, <laughs> I can't even try to explain it right now because it, it's over my head. I'm not a biologist, but I, I can read this little article here that paraphrases things and then give them back to you guys, but that's not really what I should do. You guys should read the we, article if you care about it, but what you need to know is that anti-aging may be a thing soon. We, uh, and don't forget about Google Calico, and we always talk about this, but because we're not biologists, we always screw up the name of things, and it's telomeres, not centromeres. I said that wrong once, but I'll remember from now until the end of time because, you know, the genetic... There's a, there's sort of a genetic clock mechanism, and they're like, hey, let's let's undo that. But it's not really a clock mechanism. It's just the result of cells dividing, and it's like, hey, let's fix that. And so they fix it, and it's like, oh, look, it's working fine now in mice. These geriatric mice are suddenly young and healthy. Let's do it in people and see what happens. I've got news for you. Ray Kurzweil's probably already doing it because he looks like he's like 35, and he's like 70. No, he's a little. He looks a little older than that. Maybe maybe forty. I'll go forty. But yeah, he is like <laughs> seventy. So uh, let's talk about what else they're doing um, in in science this week. So there's some new software that's been developed that allows scientists to read your basically your brain, read read your thoughts, and um, I guess the way it works is they're just looking at the activity in your brain and they're decoding it into a quote unquote voice in your head, and this can be used for people who are paralyzed, unable to speak. Uh, it can be used to communicate with them, possibly, to give them a voice. I mean, later on down the, lo the line, once this technology is perfected, maybe we'll, they'll be able to put on like a headband or a hat and then have normal conversations, similar to the way, um, well, I guess it's not exactly similar to the Stephen Hawking's because he still uses, you know, his eye muscles to say things. Um, but what does he have? He has a, a ALS, I believe. I forget what yeah. his disease yeah. is. Yeah. So. But there's also lock-in coma patients and that kind of thing. We mentioned this, not because it's like, oh, this is really cool, but you guys have to check out the videos on this because it was scary how, yeah, like, the, like, here's the image we were showing them. Here's what was happening in their brain. It's like, holy crap. Yeah, that, that's it's really wild. You can hear the sounds and everything that are coming out of their, their brain. It's pretty wild. You know, I wonder, 15 years down the road, let's put on your tinfoil hats, everybody. Get ready for it. Um, 15 years down the road, do you think they'll be able to like mount brain wave uh, readers, almost like security cameras in different places around city streets? And not only do they have now a security camera, but they can be like, okay, this guy was walking down the street. Everything looks cool. Nothing's going on. But he's thinking about punching his friend in the face. And we know <laughs> this right now. We can see it right. on the thing, or he's thinking about robbing that. He keeps walking back and back and forth in front of the store. He's thinking about robbing them. This brainwave thing knows what he's up to. How far past right is now, that? Well, right now I'm not super worried about that because there is a lengthy training process that goes in with this. And so they'll show you some movies, and then they learn the patterns uh, for your brain while you're watching some different sample movies. And so they learn your particular brain because I don't think the, the some of the brain stuff is universal. I think, but some of it isn't. And some of it is based on, I, I'm sure that some of the signals they're getting from uh, from the subject's brain here are based on their childhood experiences and things that happened during their formative years. And so my particular brain scan is going to be different than your particular brain scan for watching these, these series of movies. And so there's definitely going to be a learning phase. But I could see law enforcement and things like that, you know, prying inside somebody's brain. And so the question there becomes, you know, will this kind of thing be allowed under the Fifth Amendment? I mean, can you, if somebody's not willing to incriminate themselves, can you strap on one of these machines and ask them questions and, and you know, sort of read their brain for the answers? And, I, you know, we don't know. There's not even, that's, that's really scary to think about. All right, moving on, let's um, talk about this quick article on, let's talk about the article quickly. It's not a quick article, it's a long article, but it's on Slate.com by Adam El 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 Elkus. Elkus, yes. And um, don't fear all artificial intelligence. Elon Musk calls AI, quote unquote, our biggest existential threat. He's wrong. No, Adam, you're wrong. You're not allowed to say that because he is a lot smarter than somebody who writes for Slate.com. He's a lot smarter than I am. He's a lot smarter than most of the people watching this show. You are not allowed to categorize this as a black or a white thing and just say that he is dead wrong. And I don't think you understand what he's talking about here. I don't think that Elon Musk is against the idea of artificial intelligence. His warnings are purely to make sure that we are doing um, 
everything we can to understand the risks and consequences. That's a very wise thing for business. That's a very wise thing for the future of humanity. So he's not fear mongering here. He is saying, hey, this is really cool technology and we're all like rushing into it, you know, head first. Let's go. This is awesome. And, um, you know, if, if we were building a spaceship, this is not how we would do it. We would we would not rush into it exactly the same way. We would sit back and be like, OK, let's make sure that everything is 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 ready to go. Let's make sure there's no chance of, of something going wrong. Let's make sure that no one's going to get hurt. And let's let's just make sure that we have all of the possible consequences um, outlined so that we can be prepared for them. And let's and let's just make sure that um, we can minimize problems. I think that's what he's saying. And I think that this is kind of a sensational article here that I've also given credit to. Damn it. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, do you see a different side of this that I'm missing or that pretty much good? It, the artificial intelligence is a very Promethean event. And that means that, you know, it's like the story of Prometheus, you know, here is fire, bringing fire to mankind. Was that a good move or not? And perhaps a more contemporary example of that is nuclear weapons. You know, bringing nuclear weapons uh, to mankind, you know, scientists figured that out. And, you know, is that a net net positive for mankind? I don't know. History is still being written. It remains to be seen if some well, crazy person. <laughs> Just like fire, you can cook with it. <laughs> so, you know, artificial intelligence is going to be like nuclear weapons or like fire if you go back far enough. Uh, or, you know, the invention of gunpowder for, well, not really the invention of gunpowder, the application of gunpowder to projectile weapons. Uh, and so those are sort of Promethean events that have shaped the course of human history. And AI is really going to be no different. Um, so I think it's, it's a little short-sighted to be like, no, we're never going to, uh, we're never going to look into artificial intelligence, but the people that are working on artificial intelligence really, really have to be careful, uh, that they don't accidentally invent a monster because with artificial intelligence, it's going to be way easier to accidentally create a monster than it was with, say, nuclear weapons, which is a little bit more deliberate. All right, let's talk about some games. Let's lighten up a little bit and talk about games. Grand Theft Auto V is on its way to PC and uh, Xbox One and PlayStation 4, but it looks like they're integrating a first-person mode into these new games. Finally, this game, I've, I've, I wasn't even really looking forward to it, but now I'm looking forward to it because of the first-person mode. Uh, first person when you're driving the vehicles, first person when you're running around, uh, even aim down the barrel for uh, FPS mode. It's This is probably the PS4 version. I'm not sure, but it's probably the <laughs> PS4 version because I imagine the PC version is going to look a little better than this. And once we get our mods uh, going on, you know, it's going to be quite ridiculous because GTA 4, this looks good, but GTA 4 on PC already looks better than this because of all the mods. You know, with a little E and B uh, and yeah. yeah, it is funny. And, and some, some of those mods, yeah, yeah. I mean, it really the mods for that just look completely insane. So I can't wait to see what they what they do with this game when it comes out for PC. Uh, and I'm gonna wish I had that eight gigabyte graphics card. So <laughs> looks pretty cool. All right, uh, Ubisoft. So they've got you know you know what screw Ubisoft. Let's go on to the next thing. <laughs> those guys are just <laughs> bastards. <laughs> <laughs> the Witcher 3, uh, CD Projekt Red. These guys know what is up. They have a, a statement that they've released about DLC. And, you know, the, the, guy, the guys over there, they know the direction that the industry is going in, and they disagree with it. They disagree with it in, in almost every way. Um, you know, when the game first comes out, you can get it on Steam if you want, because that's a platform people want it on. But on day one, you can buy it DRM-free on good old games. That's part of their core philosophy. They want to make sure that they have a DRM-free version. And um, they are guaranteeing that there's going to be 16 DLCs, and they're going to be free for everybody. So when you buy the original game over the next, whatever, year or so, 16 different DLCs are going to be coming out, and they're all going to be free. That's... The kind of that's the kind of company I want to support. I mean, even if I wasn't in, I mean, I'm interested in this game. I want to buy it and play it for sure. But even if I didn't want to buy and play this game, I might actually have to just to support a company uh, with this philosophy because they are a major company now. Even though they started as they're still indie, you know, they started as an indie company. They're they're now a pretty big major company. Uh, their titles, their, this title is going to sell a, a lot of copies, but their philosophy is still uh, favoring the the public and and and. I like that. The gamer. So, 
Yep, it's all about the gamer, man. All right, I think that's pretty much all I've got to talk about today. We've got some game deals here on our website. Don't forget to go check those out. They're changing all the time. Just text syndicate.com uh, forward slash game deals. Looks like Call of Duty. You know, some people actually like this version of Call of Duty. I, I, can't, I can't trash it because I haven't played it. I mean, I've, I've watched some people playing it, and it, as far as the the first, I mean, the the, uh, the single-player element go, it looks just as Hollywood and cheesy as all the rest of them. Um, but a lot of people say the multiplayer is good. Even even uh, some big-name people out there who I usually listen to, like Boogie2298, uh, said that he thought he liked the multiplayer, and uh, Total Biscuit said he liked the multiplayer on that game. So I'm not going to come right out and just say it sucks because that would be ignorant of me. But I don't really want to play <laughs> it at the same time. <laughs> anyway, that that's on sale if you want to pick it up that way. I had to rant for no reason. Wow, it's on sale for $49.99, the price the games used to be, instead of the list price of 60 <laughs> So, yeah. Anyway. Check all that stuff out. Hope you guys enjoyed the, uh, the Barnacles interview. Be sure to check out uh, our video on the future of 3D printing with Barnacles, and uh, that's pretty much it. We'll see you guys uh, in the next episode. Mm-hmm.